good evening, good morning, good night, good day, whatever time it is where you live and whatever part of the planet you live on. Welcome to The Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. My website is www.mossuponstones.com. And if you look in the description box below this video on YouTube, you will see various links to all my websites, blogs, contact information and how you can support me. I want to thank you for listening to the show last week in phenomenal numbers. I was over the moon when I saw how quickly the view counts took off on YouTube and how you must have shared it around because I got about three times as many listeners or views in the same period I normally would have gotten in the old days of the velocity of now. I noticed a lot of new people have come on board from the uh, the Corona Chronicles and I'm delighted that you're still around and you're enjoying the format of the program which is quite different and tonight will be no exception. I think I'm going to talk about in the first hour the dangers of going too far down the rabbit hole and in the second half of the show I want to talk about the famous Mottman events that took place in Point Pleasant in West Virginia in 1966 and possible other discussions discussions about the nature of those events as well as insights that haven't really been properly examined and also what it means beyond Point Pleasant and what the whole experience means in terms of 40 in events so I think you'll find that quite interesting. The first part of the show was kind of inspired by researching for the new Velocity of Now, the relaunch Velocity of Now and Looking around the conspiracy world, I don't watch or listen to other shows. I don't have, not because I have anything against them. I just don't have the time, and I don't really. I'm really out of touch of what's going on out there and what's happening in the in the alt media sphere. And you know, so I just would basically look at people's Facebook pages or. T- Twitter feeds or Instagram who would be the kind of people who would follow me and my show in general although I have a very very mixed audience I I was as much of a mainstream audience as I do a an alternative audience which just suits me just fine I think that's a good thing and I'm not interested in preaching to the converted and that's a big thing with alt media a lot of it is about preaching to the converted and as a result it becomes a kind of a an echo chamber of the same old things and the same old mistakes that get recycled and regurgitated over and over again. And that's really what the first part of the show tonight will be about rabbit holding. Going too deep down the rabbit hole to the point where your arse blocks out the sun and... It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing because what happens is it distracts you from the path of genuine knowledge and leads you towards the world of hysteria. And it's not a good thing because what happens is you will eventually find out you were talking bollocks. And it has a terrible, disheartening feeling upon a person when they say they put all their... They can put all their fate or all their energy into a conspiracy and people being what they are unfortunately then try to evangelize that conspiracy and get other people to listen and uh, often bore other people or annoy other people or even worry other people with these conspiracies it runs they run run away with them and when they find out it was bullshit or led them nowhere the worst thing of all happens is they become so despondent and so disheartened by that experience of knowing they were following, chasing a ghost or a shadow, that they lose interest in all conspiracies and all alternative topics, topics, and they don't come back. And that's a great loss. I've seen them over the years. I've met many of them. Many of them. In the last 10 years, I've met so many good people who went down the rabbit hole but went down too many burrows too many channels too many warrens and the sun was eventually blocked out and it was because they didn't focus and the problem is is this is they pinpoints you have things like you've had things in the conspiracy sphere for a long time now called connecting the dots well you can connect dots of anything to anything else 
and this is a huge problem where you will find that you'll f- get more satisfaction achieve more and inspire people to look into these topics if you concentrate on one specific tangent and you follow it and we can all make mistakes you see this is what i was i've done it myself this is what i'm saying there's a difference between a conspiracy theorist and a truther and what what men people make fun of conspiracy theorists today what they really are talking about are truthers truthers t-r-o-o-f-e-r-s who are just conspiracy junkies for the sake of it now when i was growing up it, it was actually quite hip and cool to be a conspiracy theorist. I know that sounds amazing, but it was considered part of the alternative lifestyle. And all my friends in the music scene or on the art scene when I lived in New York or when I lived in Dublin when I was younger, all these like freaks and weirdos and very interesting people. But uh, all of them went on to do quite well in life. But all of us used to sit around talking about conspiracy theories. We used to talk about the big topic was the JFK assassination. And then later on, someone would bring in something to do with the, the moon landings, were they real or not? And it was fantastic conversations we had. But the great thing was that, and this is the important thing, we didn't necessarily believe strongly in the conspiracy theory we were talking about. It was more a case of spinning words and ideas out there that gave you a sense of the establishment are dodgy stay you know be wary of the establishment be wary of politics be wary of mass media and be wary of the military industrial complex and that was enough that's all you needed it was a, a, it was a beautiful thing actually it was very very healthy it was a very good thing and Nobody said back then, oh, you're, you're crazy or you're full of shit. It's because you, it was the way it was presented. Now, the modern conspiracy true for world, it comes from the internet. Remember, even when YouTube started, it was probably a good six or seven years after 9-11. And there wasn't a hell of a lot of 9-11 conspiracies before YouTube. But... On the early days of YouTube, one faction or community that really seized it and used it to its potential was the conspiracy theorists. And it spread like wildfire in no time. It went from being, you know, 0.0001% of society being conspiracy theorists or looking into these conspiracies to a probably two, three four percent of society and that was directly because of youtube and that was a colossal increase people would watch videos about the twin towers coming down and all kinds of things and david ike had already been kind of well known through the new age scene so a lot of his videos and things he'd done around the world since 1990 or whenever it was he came out on wogan a lot of that stuff started to immediately hit youtube quite early on And then a lot of people in the conspiracy scene with very limited resources like Windows Movie Maker and also because there wasn't much of a sort of a problem with copyright and clips back then were able to make very plausible, decent videos uh, that gave a convincing insight into a conspiratorial idea and that became the the seed that was planted for so many people now i had already i was already something of a conspiracy theorist from the time i was a kid there was books like david yallop's deliverance from evil and then in god's name had really you know shown me that there was certainly something strange going on and i'd also read heavily about because I was always kind of interested in serial killers, the David Berkowitz thing, and the connection to the David Berkowitz was Son of Sam, and the Son of Sam murders, and the connection of him to the Process Church of the Final Judgment, you know, a long, long time ago, got me interested in these people. And also, you know, that touched upon Savile, believe it or not, which I'll explain later. 
And when I first got to New York, I was quite young and I was staying in an apartment in Van Cortland Park up in the North Bronx, New Yonkers. And that was like Process Church, David Berkowitz territory. And I used to go, you know, running around. The, Van Cortland Park is all sports fields at the front part. Uh, and then you have Broadway, the same Broadway that comes up from Manhattan. It goes right up through the Bronx and into Yonkers. And so on that side of it, the, where the subways end, the terminals, I think it's the number three line or the number one line. I can't remember. I think it's the one with number three line. And they all end by, one of them ends by Van Cortland Park. Now, it's all sports fields, soccer, cricket, baseball. The West Indians play cricket, believe it or not, there. And then at the back of that is a kind of a wooded hilly area. And that's where a lot of what they used to say satanic rituals and that kind of thing took place. Now, I've always been interested in the cult anyway. So I just, well, I used to spend, you know, time exploring it. And it was also a very beautiful place. Uh, the woodlands, particularly in the autumn, what the Americans call fall, you have these beautiful coloured leaves on the trees, which we don't get in Ireland. So it was just a wonderful experience. And I saw like a rattlesnake once and things like that. And... Uh, yeah, sure enough, I found, you know, you'd find I'd come across a place where there was pentagrams painted on walls and 666. and But then you'd find other things that looked like they were proper ritual sites where an animal had been killed or something like that. And a fire was there. So that was, I knew about these things. And I knew about the connection to these things. So when, by the time... YouTube came along. Look, when people say to me, I used to believe in everything mainstream and then I saw a documentary about 9-11 and I, it, I was never the same again. I was woken up. Well, that experience never happened to me because I was already in that, in that zone before, you know, that the YouTube came along. So when the YouTube came along, it was almost like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, I knew about that. Oh, I finally got to see a video, but I always wondered about that. Oh, there's that TV show that was controversial and was covered up. And, oh, I get to see it finally at last. A lot of that kind of thing. A lot of that. That's what that's what it meant for me in the early days. It was that, that, in, that was able to kind of like validate some of the things I, I always knew. I was always interested in anyway. And so... That was the kind of time that the, the 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 truthers were gestated. These are people who basically are addicted to conspiracies, and they are some types. It comes in moderation, of course. There are some types who could actually believe if if you give them a conspiracy theory video, no matter what, they will absolutely completely believe it, no doubt. Now, regardless of evidence, it just has to be told about. And then there's other types who, you know, you play, you know, you present it in a certain way, and as I said, connect dots, and they'll start believing it. And you know, so there's a, a general tendency to somehow either immediately or eventually believe it. And this is where the problem starts. And this is where you have to be you know here's i'm up on youtube researching are you really researching or are you being brainwashed this is an important question you have to ask yourself and it doesn't matter how intelligent or smart you are it can happen to anyone a lot of it is rooted in addictions a lot of people i know that are recovered alcoholics became mad youtube conspiracy theorists or you know the types who chain smoke and things like that and also unfortunately huge amounts of weed smoking and that helps almost hypnotize them even more especially if there's music and things like that in the video now i'll give you an example of something that's happened recently believe although i have a reputation as being kind of like the most conservative close-minded person in alt media i'm really not i'm honestly not i'm not i look into just about any conspiracy that catches my attention out of the blue now to some i won't insult my intelligence by look it's just the, the flat earth I will, I will not even insult my intelligence with that by going there but because other things i will so you know i'll give it a fair blast if it catches and then i'll say okay in most cases i'll say yeah there's something to this there's something definitely to this 
but that's not the same thing as saying that the entire conspiracy is true. And that's what happens when you go so far down the rabbit hole that your arse blocks out the sun. Now, a good example of that was the adrenochrome thing, okay? I first started hearing about that about two years ago. And the prevailing conspiracy within sort of main street, mainstream through for them is that adrenochrome is taken from the pineal glands of the brains of children who were richly sacrificed by the Illuminati and they used the adrenochrome to maintain youth and stay stay younger, stay, have that youth. And then they'll show pictures of, you know, celebrities who are supposed to be on the adrenochrome, right? So, yeah, adrenochrome exists. Yeah, I know about it. Sure, yeah. And then you look at it and you see that the whole thing is a pile of monumental bullshit. Monumental bullshit. There's zero proof anywhere that the globalists or the elites or the non-existent Illuminati get children and sacrifice them and extract adrenochrome from them. Zero. Absolutely none. Now, I'm going to show you how this came about and the dangers of dot connecting. People will grasp at any straw they can to make it true, to make you want to, make them want to believe it. So therefore, they will take things that are true, but not take them in the context of the truth that they are. So example, yes, adrenochrome does exist. We've established that, okay? So the next dot they'll connect to that is they'll say, so many children vanish every year. Thousands of children vanish every year. Here's the statistics from the FBI or Interpol or, or you know, Scotland Yard. And yes, it's true. Thousands of children vanish every year. Now, in the mind of the truther, that means prepubescent children who are snatched off the streets, taken into bohemian grove or somewhere else and then the adrenochrome they're sacrificed and the adrenochrome taken from their brains or something like that but what they don't do is they don't check this, those statistics behind that the vast majority of children who go missing every year are teenagers who've run away from home you're still legally a child until you're 18 a lot of them huge numbers of them are teenage girls who ran off with their older boyfriend. 16, 17 year old girls who ran off with a boyfriend. They are all, nearly all eventually reunited with their families. Another one is fathers in custody battles where the courts don't protect or look after the father's interests or maybe the mother's in a relationship with an alcoholic or a junkie or a paedophile and he's worried about his child. He takes the kids and he makes a run for it. Then there's children who genuinely do disappear. Maybe paedophiles get them. But there's maybe they have accidents. Maybe they get lost in the back of their... In America, even. In, in, fast, in fast areas of America, you have animals just behind your backyard that will eat you. From bears to, to, to cougars to, you know, all kinds of things. And that's what happens. That the kids will go playing in the backyard one day and a brown bear comes by and goes, hmm, lunch. This is what happens too. But the vast majority of these children who go missing are teenage runaways or parents who've taken in custody uh, situations who've stolen their kids and run off to keep them from being raised by a crazy mother or a mother who won't let the husband see the kids or she or the, the father's in a relationship with a junkie or something or the father's a junkie. Or this, that's what most of them are. And then I hear children, I hear, they automatically think prepubescent. Okay, so the numbers of children vanishing is true. Is true, absolutely. Yes, and there are children who are stolen to be used by paedophiles. That's very true, okay? But they're a tiny number. So then you'll have people saying, oh, well, the numbers of children missing proves that they're all being used for adrenochrome. You see, you've went, you went down the rabbit hole and then you went too far. Now, then they'll say, well, adrenochrome was real. I know people that are on, I know people that were back in the day were on adrenochrome. You know, adrenochrome can be synthesized. Any good chemist can synthesize the adrenochrome molecule. 
So therefore, no need to kill a child. You, a, a, a drug chemist can make it. So, okay. How many have even checked that out? I bet almost none of them. Now, at the same time, I'm going to talk about the real stuff that goes on. While people are, and this is why the establishment create, or should I say, they they shift and they modify and they influence conspiracy theories to move it away from the real stuff. Classic example will be this. So all the conspiracy theories are all looking for babies who are being sacrificed by Bill Gates or some uh, globalist in their minds uh, to get their adrenochrome so, you know, Ellen the Generous can look five years younger, okay? And there's a big Illuminati ritual where they're like, look at David D's painting, this kind of thing, right? If they're using adrenochrome, in, it's, it's synthesized. It's as simple as that, if they're using it. Now, the real thing. The Franklin cover-up is a real example of paedophile rings in power. And that the establishment is filled with paedophiles and sex killers. And an example of that would be the Franklin cover-up. Where on the eve, and literally an hour before Yorkshire TV in the 1980s was to broadcast a, a superb investigation into the Franklin cover-up. The program was pulled literally an hour beforehand. A phone call were made from the United States or someone had a gun put to their head. But Yorkshire Television pulled the program off the air before it broadcast. Now the Franklin cover-up, as, you, as you, most of you will know, involved children being trafficked directly into Washington DC's political circles. Now when I say children, we should really say teenage boys. So it's pederasts we're talking about. There's a difference between a pederast and a pedophile. And these, these are these this basically proved that Washington DC now don't only be thinking the politicians, be thinking the senior civil servants and the bureaucrats and all the press corps and everything there are pederasts who pleasure themselves with young boys. And the Franklin cover up showed conclusively that these boys were being trafficked out through Omaha, Nebraska because of its access to things like Boys Town, the famous uh, orphan's home for young boys or wayward boys or boys who needed help. You know, he ain't heavy, he's my brother kind of thing. And the father Corrigan and all that, which turned out to be nothing more than an abuse, uh, a horrible Catholic abuse centre where eventually the Catholic, the Jesuits started selling boys to political top people, and remember, not just politicians, civil servants too, the ones you don't hear about, in Washington, D.C. Now, that's a real conspiracy. And the fact that journalists and other people involved in investigating that have vanished. Now, that was the Reagan White House now. George Bush Sr., who was the vice president at the time, also head of the CIA, now that's a real one. You've got it. You've got it. Now, so why do you need the supernaturalism of, you know, people in robes sacrificing babies while they're saying sing, singing songs to Satan? There's the X Files stuff. Now, if you, if you, you know, for some, I, I keep telling you, stop trying to wake people up. You're already awake, okay? You see, what does not matter, okay? But I understand that the people that are husbands or their boyfriends or their their best friends are not awake. And they feel kind of socially isolated. And because of this this course called Christianity, we have this evangelical need to convert others. And that's where that comes from. And so people who don't mean any harm and have the best intentions and are often driven by, well, compassion for children might start going, might start watching these videos about you know, children missing adrenochrome, and they'll start pulling things like, oh, Lady Gaga's new video proves it, or, you know, Marina Abramovich proves it, you know, and this kind of thing, and this proves it, and, you know, blah, 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 proves it. And then they go and they tell their friends about this, and they'll play, the, look, 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 look at this, look at this new video, this look new, this new video by, 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 by Lady Gaga, look at you, look at, see, see, she's, she's talking about the Illuminati, Illuminati, Illuminati sacrifice, and your friends just think you're a fucking nutcase, and you are a fucking nutcase, 
because you've gone so far down the rabbit hole your arse has blocked out the sun now and then they come back to me on facebook or come back to their conspiracy friends and you read these videos all over the place and they say things like i wish i never told my my girlfriend she left me i wish i never got into this stuff blah 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 and that's because you ran away with yourself now wouldn't it be much easier to say have you ever heard about the franklin cover-up and your friend goes what franklin cover-up what's that Yorkshire Television, which was a big TV station in England, was going to broadcast them um, a documentary about George Bush Senior and all these, all these, all these weirdos in the U.S. government were getting young boys trafficked to them. Really? Where did you hear that? Oh well, the documentary's back up on YouTube. That was someone who's uploaded it. That's really, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, you should watch it. It's it's it's, it's pretty it's pretty gr- it's pretty weird it's pretty grim, and. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's true or not. That You always say that. I don't know if it's true or not. But, you know, definitely check it out. And they'll come back to you a week later saying, Shit, I watched that Franklin cover-up documentary. And it was... Fuck me. I couldn't believe that the, the Reagan White House with George Bush Sr. as vice president were... There was, like... There was the kids being interviewed and there was all the papers and the documents and even newspaper headlines about pedophiles in the White House. Wow. Because they're watching, you see, they're they're used to a mainstream show, and that's why they believe it. And then you got them, you got bang, you've proved that you're no longer a nutcase, a, a headcase conspiracy tinfoil hat wearing fruit. You're not that anymore. You're not a fruit nut bar. And how? And, and you feel good. You feel good. Whereas when screaming in with like, uh, Lady Lady Gaga's new video, she has like a uh, uh, symbolism of children being sacrificed and spirit cooking and all, all this stuff, and it's all tied up with, with pizza. And they're going to think you're a fucking headcase. And all you'll do is be frustrated, and you're inquisitive, and that they'll laugh at you, they'll mock you, you might lose your boyfriend, your girlfriend. And then the great tragedy then is because you feel like such a fool and you're so despondent that your critical mind then just shuts off completely and you go back to the mainstream. And you say, I wish I never, ever watched one of those dumbass, dumbass things ever again. Stupid. And the sad thing was, in some ways, you're kind of right. The Franklin cover-up proved you were right. But you went about it all wrong. Your sales, your sales pitch, was all wrong. Remember, a U two conspiracy video's sales pitch to you doesn't necessarily translate well into everyday life. And where if you had to just just casually mention the Franklin cover up thing, you would have friends all around you now who wouldn't be questioning your sanity, and who would be would be be telling other people. You can't believe it. You know, they're all, they're all pedophiles in the Reagan White House. All at the top. Boys are being trafficked in. And, they're, you know, this is... And then you've gotten the truth down. Then you're a truther and not a throofer. Amazing, isn't it? That's simple. It took that... But you couldn't put the fucking brakes on. You couldn't put the brakes on. Now, I'm not chastising you. I'm trying to relay the, the frustration that many of you listening to this show will have gone through. And this also brings us to think, how do I research? You'll have this big thing. Oh, I spend six hours a night on YouTube researching. No, you spend six hours a night on YouTube watching videos. You know, you see that thing, research flat earth. No, what that really says is uh, indoctrinate yourself into a repetitive religion. I remember years back, research Holly Grieg. And that turned, and, not, and, and no one, and, and that, 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 you know, again, because... Like, I have a friend in England, right? And my friend in England, through her job, uh, became aware that there were senior paedophiles in the town in England that she lived in that were involved in with messing with little boys. And she, she tried to come forward about it and it ended up costing her business and everything. Because her heart was in the right place and she was seeking justice. Now, she was exonerated eventually uh, because... The individual involved was arrested and went to court and went down for pedophilia. Uh, but at the time that she was trying to blow the whistle, 
it her life was made a hell. She lost her business, everything. Her, you know, lost friends, a lot. A horror story. Much. She went through much worse than you lot ever went through. Just talking about a video uh, you saw on YouTube. She went through the real thing, and she was exonerated in the end. And that was it. Was okay in the end, you know. But it just goes to show you that you can't dive right in. You can't dive right in, although our natural sense of justice and decency makes you want to dive right in. So that brings us invariably to how do you actually research? Now, the Holly Greig thing, it turns out that the mother was a nut job. And this is another thing. You, the, the truthers, throughers, constantly assume that if someone says something, they're telling the truth. They don't understand that people lie for lots of reasons. Often, sometimes they can be custody battles to get back at an ex-husband or boyfriend, like the Hampstead thing. But you don't see that. You don't see that. You go, oh, it must be true because it feeds this this desire in me for an X-Files kind of thing. And that's what happens. This is, you know, that's that's a very dark and dangerous road to go down. It's not good at all. It's not healthy. But at the same time, I have no doubt that, yeah, institutional paedophilia and pederasty is a huge thing among the establishment. You don't have to convince me of that. I know that. And I, I would, although I have seen zero proof of a some kind of substance being used, some kind of, or let's say, a lady bath, a countess bathroy type scenario among these types, bathing in blood or whatever, wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me, but it doesn't. There's a difference between desiring these things and getting proof about them, and that was one of the great things about the disasters that came about as a result of the whole remember free man on the land thing. Oh well, here's documents, Black's Law Dictionary. Here's papers. Here's statutory things. That and the other. It's legitimate. No, it's not. It's bullshit. And you see that like all the time with these like. Uh, indictments to arrest you know the famous famous sealed indictments they don't exist remember the 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 documents to arrest the pope and the queen of england oh it's going to happen because they have documents they're going they've they filed you know the whole thing i filed a summons to arrest the pope so it's going to happen sure if you go down to any high court every day of the week week there are lunatics who are filing documents to arrest you know, TV celebrities that did something that there's, there's a lot of cases out there, but you never seem to you never seem to think that this guy who's claiming he's he's going to arrest the Queen is a nutcase, or this guy who's going to arrest the Pope is a nutcase. You are, because he has a document or an indictment, he's automatically telling the truth in your mind. Another one is now there's a guy now claiming to be the real King of England. This is a great one. He's now claiming to be the real King of England. If you listen to his videos, it's absolute bullshit. Oh, but he, but he has legal documents. So what? Anyone can make legal documents. Signed off by an affidavit. Signed off by a lawyer. Pay a lawyer $200 or 200 euros, he'll sign anything for you. That's not the same thing as it actually being true. And you still believe, there's magical bold words. Oh, and then you see, like, a, a, you, see, you might see a press conference about Illuminati killing people, killing babies. And you believe it because it has a ticker tape like Fox News running down the bottom. And then you feel, you don't even check that it's all makey up and the, the TV channel doesn't exist. Or the person claiming to be a judge isn't, has never produced any proof that he's a judge. But he must be a judge because there's a gavel in his hand. You see how easily led down that route you are? And I, and you, and I know, I'm not standing here as Mr. Snob. It's Mr. Snob talking down to you because you're all so stupid. It's not for that reason at all. It's for two reasons. One, I'm trying to help you avoid a lot of misery in the future when you discover that this stuff has all been bullshit and you've wasted so much of your psychic energy and maybe even much of your the, the goodness in your life or thrown away a lot of goodness in your life on this bullshit. And two, the real conspiracies are getting away. The real conspiracies are getting away. Now, I'll give you an example of how I almost went down the rabbit hole on one topic. And it wrecked, it, 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 the sun nearly went and wrecked the whole thing from me. Well, I didn't nearly wreck it, but it, it, it taught me a valuable lesson. As you all know, I've been very interested in Jimmy Savile for a very long time. 
and Jimmy Savile was one of the most monstrous human beings that possibly ever lived, mainly because of his connections. He was. He asked the average person in the street, what do you know about Jimmy Savile? They go, he was a paedophile. You know, that was only the... The, that's only the the, rib, the ribbon on the wrapper of the appalling present that he actually was. He was a necrophiliac. He used to take corpses in in Leeds Hospital and race them with the porters in wheelchairs. He took he, while he was having sex with the corpses in the morgue, he would take the glass eyeballs out of their head, and then go on have them made into rings. And then go on top of the pops that week, flashing his rings, his gold rings with the glass eyeballs in uh, set into the ring of the from the corpse he had sex with just before that. He was definitely involved in the Yorkshire Ripper case, as you see in my videos. Jimmy Savile's a six 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 serial killer, and at least one of those murders can definitely be attributed to him. Uh, he even said it. He has. A strange and disturbing and still well hidden connection to Moira Hindley of the Moore's murderers. Now, I, when I was in, when I was first became the investigator of Savile, I, I kind of made a name for myself in the alternative media and mainstream investigating Savile. One of the things that jumped out right away was when he first dyed his hair blonde. How he looked uncannily like the famous mugshot of Moira Hindley of the Moore's murderers, the child murderers, along with her boyfriend, Dean Brady, in Manchester in England. And I didn't have any hard proof on it, but things started to come out that brought me further down into the research that was validating it. For instance, at the time that the Moore's murders were happening in Manchester, Jimmy Savile was the host of Top of the Pops. And Top of the Pops, at, in those days, was put out of a church, a converted church, that was made into a BBC music studio, you know, a performance studio, Stage, on Dickinson Road in Manchester. Uh, he was in close proximity to both Ian Brady and Moira Hindley. And I surmised that he was image was probably was probably based on that mugshot of Moira Hindley, that infamous mugshot after she was arrest, arrested. And when I first put that out there, I was absolutely savage. There was a skeptics board, it's still going, and they tore me a new one. And these 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 uh these invest skeptical researchers literally tore my life apart uh, analyzed everything about me all, all i said was i believe that it's possible that jimmy savile modeled his blonde haired image on moira hindley and that's all i said i didn't it just basically just came out with that uh, but that was the end of the world for me as far as these people were concerned and they tore me to pieces and uh then Louis Thoreau's book came out in which Louis Thoreau asked Jimmy Savile about Moira Hindley and Jimmy Savile said, I am the Moira Hindley story. Now that that tread was then hidden off that board and did they bother apologising to me, all these rational sceptical gentlemen who seek reason and science? Nope, not in your feckin' Nelly. Nope, they just closed the tread and then they moved on. Even though I was completely and 100% exonerated, I didn't need it. Like my friend in England who was eventually exonerated by finding out there was a paedophile in her town. The being exonerated was, yeah, okay, it's okay, it's, 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 it's an okay feeling, but it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't give you a sense of triumph. It, it doesn't make you feel amazing or anything like that. Because it all does is confirm the darkness of this world. Not only what goes on, but also the people around that didn't believe you. And also the goodness of this world, the people who did believe you and did stick by you. Now, as you know me, I am a great believer in synchronicity and so on. So all the time this is going on, 
um, it's around the same time I took an interest later in the the pusher serial killer in Manchester. Now, at the same time, that tied into the Savile thing because I can remember being alongside the canal at the Rochdale Canal, where a lot of them, the murders happened, in Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire, and very beautiful part of England in a very pretty town, and having a few pints in a pub beside the canal and you know I'm water carries memory and there's something about the, st- the stagnant canals there's something about the water and stuff like that and I kept thinking I kept looking at the canal water and thinking Savile 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 and then it turns out that there was a famous case of a, a girl who was found murdered dead in that canal I think her name was Les- Leslie Joe Rimmer I think her name was I don't have the notes at me right now, but she was found dead in the canal, and literally every male in Hebden Bridge was made a, a suspect. She vanished coming out of the Trades Club, which I've been in myself loads of times. Uh, I've done quite a few events up in that area part of England, and she was she got went left her mother to go get a box of cornflakes for breakfast next morning, was never seen again. It just so turns out that Jimmy Savile had a caravan which he stayed in on his own right there where the girl went missing. And literally everybody was interviewed in, in Hebden Bridge, every male except Jimmy Savile. And eventually you had the local vicar up there saying, why wasn't Jimmy Savile qu- questioned now that we know about him? Well, the same reason why when when uh, when Irene Richardson's body, the prostitute, allegedly killed by well was killed by allegedly by the sole killer Sutcliffe in the Yorkshire Ripper was found in Savile's backyard with two sets of teeth marks in her body during a frenzied a frenzied sex murder attack they were knocked on Savile's door and asked for a a dental imprint of his teeth and he said something like, oh, I'll just make a phone call and that's the end of you guys. And they never came back. That was the point that Margaret Thatcher took an interest in the Yorkshire murders, Yorkshire Ripper case, which was a whole psycho... I mean, I'm not going to go talk into that in there again, but it was a whole... You want to talk about a psychological gaslighting of a whole part of England. You want to, you want to see what went on then. The voice tapes played in pubs and everyone's silent and terrified and this kind of thing. You know, it was a total psyop on its own level. But Savile was at least involved in one of those murders. So then, you know, th- my dots were connecting. My dots were connecting, you know, and and, and confirmed. And uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm 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 a pretty hot shot conspiracy researcher here. Not only have I put these things out about Savile, but they've they've been confirmed later on, and um, lo- constantly. And so yeah, I'm looking pretty good. And then these people start to talk about Savile being a wizard or an occultist. Now, being an occultist myself, it surprised me that I didn't jump on this about Savile. So I felt like, well, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of sup- of depravity about Savile that was that was supernatural, that was beyond just like a you know your usual freak. And so I said, yeah, why not? And then you, there's a few videos on YouTube, and they're all rubbish when you think about them now. But like I was looking at them, saying things like he used a cigar as a wand. He used to do a TV show called Jim will fix it, and very wizardy. You know, he'd make a kid's dream come true, true, and then he'd get a medal, and he go, hey, "What that kind of girl's gambling exam? Oh, I like exam, and all this kind of thing." You know, you know, hey, you, you got a young boy here, yeah, yeah. and 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 you know, I was thinking, you know, and there's pictures of him in like robes and stuff, and. And, like, I gave it about an hour's worth of consideration, and I came to myself, what are, you, what are you doing? There's absolutely zero proof that Savile is, it was involved in the occult. He was a practicing hardcore Catholic. And uh, they talk about, like, that he was you know, born on Halloween, and he was a seventh son. That, that means nothing. It's not proof of anything. He wasn't an occultist, but they, you know, you, you, I was almost going down that rabbit hole until I realized there's zero, like the adrenochrome being taken out of babies and heads and rituals. When you start to look at it properly, there's nothing to back it up. So I didn't need that to validate 
what I'd already been, I had brought out about Savile. I didn't need it. I didn't need it. I had enough and just in that alone I had enough. And so that was the end of that for me. But it just goes to show you that it's so easy to be lured into some aspect of a concept. Like for 9-11, yeah, like it does seem very strange how the buildings came down. And, you know, none of us are, are engineers and stuff like that. And we don't, we, it looks like controlled explosion, but what do we really know? And this kind of thing. And, you know, it, it starts out with like, you know, plausible, plausible theories like yeah the plant you know they could have planted pre-planted explosives in the tower like that's that's plausible right and then it goes from that to holographic planes you know this nonsense this kind of thing and uh and you know the and and then uh, you know magical weapon directed energy weapons where there's where you know there's nothing to, there's nothing to substantiate that it's just more dot connecting and then the whole 9-11 rational investigation is then destroyed by all these flights of fancy. Endless tunnels in the rabbit hole. Because what happens is when people don't get immediate satisfaction from one thing, they think by adding a, this additional layer of bullshit will bring the... You know, if they're starting out with bullshit, right, or mostly bullshit, adding additional layers of bullshit doesn't make the original bullshit true. And that's what happens in a lot of these conspiracies. A lot of these conspiracies, you know. Like, for instance, the flat earth thing, right? Maps are, as we were shown them in school, are wrong. There's a reason for this. They were made to balance on the screen, okay? They're made to balance on the page. So Africa is, is smaller than it is in real life. Canada and Greenland are much bigger than they are in real life. But that was a graphic design decision. When an airplane is flying across the world, where an a a ship is sailing across the sea, they get the real maps, nautical maps, and proper geographic settings and bearings and GPS. They don't, you know, it's not graphic design. It's the same with the projection of the earth that's used by the United Nations. That is just graphic design to make it fit on a badge. And yet people take that literally. And again, the real mystery, the real conspiracy is, yeah, our maps are bullshit, that they gave the maps they gave us in school absolutely are bullshit. You know, the map of the world we saw in school was bullshit. It was to make Europe and North America basically sit in the, sit, sit in the most prominent areas in the middle, and they squashed and made up and everything else the way they could. But that's that's all that that that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting, not conspiracy, but an interesting you know thing to talk about why they did that, the psychological and the colonialist reasons for doing that. And somehow that becomes proof that the earth is flat because all the maps are wrong. No, no, the nautical charts that if you, you ever go go to any shop, bookshop or map shop that has nautical maps, and you see they look very different. Often, you know, and that's because and they have all the that that because if they if they were if they're not right, the ship gets the ships crash on the surf shore. That's the proof of that. And then you say people then they'll show other things. You see, just because something exists doesn't mean it proves something else. So they'll say, Antarctica doesn't exist because it's there's no flights across it. So why would you want to fly across it? Where are you going to? Also, there's no flights from Western Australia all across across the Indian Ocean to Africa. This kind of thing is South Africa. They fly up along the coast. Well, that's because. They have to be... They can't fly out into... First of all, they've only recently had planes that are capable of going those distances. And secondly, they have to fly with a place of, in, in an area where something goes wrong, the plane can land in an emergency. Being stuck out in the middle of the southern pole of inaccessibility, where the nearest landmass is two or 3,000 miles away, is no use when you have your, 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 your cabin pressure you know, dep suddenly depressor depressurized or you start leaking fuel over the middle of Antarctica and the nearest airport is 2,000 miles away. This is why they fly on those places. Yes, it's true. They don't fly over Antarctica. Yes, it's true until recently they didn't fly from Australia to South Africa. But there's logical, rational reasons for this. And then the layer of bullshit on top of that is planes don't have fuel in them. 
they can't possibly take off. I mean, this is the nonsense, you know. And then, and then people, you wonder why people think you're a lunatic. You see, because you couldn't prove the Antarctic thing, and you couldn't prove this, that, and the other, and the Earth was flat. You add a new layer of bullshit onto that. There's no fuel in planes. Planes fly fly by air or some shit like that. You know, you, you can't do this. This is because the only person, the, the biggest victim of all this in the end is not anyone else. It's you. You can make all the videos you want about this and all this. You are the biggest victim in the end because you will have wasted your life on bullshit and also distracted yourself from the real thing. The real thing, you know. Yes, look at things holistically. That's the most important, most important advice of all I could give you. Look at things holistically. Stand back, examine. If you see a new theory or a new piece of evidence come in, look at it holistically. A good example of that is six million children or so on go missing every year. You look at the statistics, you find out that five million, five hundred thousand of them are teenage runaways suddenly they're not five million being you know having their brains drilled by you know lady gaga or ellen DeGeneres. now at the same time too that's not to dispel all all conspiracy theories for instance the pizza gate thing there definitely is something to that absolutely there's something to that it's very difficult to understand or figure out what it is but you can tell there's something very fishy going on with that whole Pizzagate thing. Something, and it's probably just basic pedophilia, if it exists. But that's it's very difficult to find really good evidence. Now, what happens is then the truthers go on to, you know, they'll say Marina Abramovich, you know, what's his name? The Podesta brothers will have a painting or something belonging to her. They know her. There's a picture of them with her. Spirit cooking. Now, if you look at the spirit cooking thing, yes, it's a cult. It's definitely, she uses the occult a lot in her artwork. But I've been telling you that for years, that the, that the outsider art world is often occult rituals hidden inside these performance art things. Often with the one agenda to make the artist successful, as it has done in uh, uh, Marina Abramovich's work. But this spirit cooking thing doesn't mean they're eating live bodies and things like that. The shock is part of the generating the charge. It's yeah, it's definitely a form of black magic, but it's not as necessarily as bad as what you think it is. Often it's just to make money. But there's definitely like the 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 the, the pizza gate thing is definitely something very smelly and fishy there, definitely. But it's hard to get evidence. Now, evidence isn't... Like, for instance, truthers love to do this. They'll find a photograph of Brian Epstein standing next to someone famous. And that now proves that the person standing next to them who's famous is somehow a, a serial satanic pedophile. Famous people take photographs at these famous people's parties next to one another all the time. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're best friends. That's how the it's like business, big business people meet at the golf club. It's the bullshit, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that individual pictured next to Jeffrey Epstein was involved in anything Jeffrey Epstein did. Whereas Prince Andrew and Epstein is very suspicious. That's a real one, you know? So stick, you know, this stick with the real ones. Don't start looking for dots to connect. Because then you lose sight of the real thing. Then you lose sight of the real. There's a good way to research. And there's a shitty way to research. And let me tell you something. The sh the good way to research. May not produce. The most. Intoxicating adrenaline rush. As when you are watching. Some conspiracy theory. Where it's like. They're talking about, you know, market obesity and how the elites, they practice child sacrifice. They get involved in all these things and they do this and they they, they, they pray to Baphomet and they sacrifice.
Ding, 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 Adding spooky music and spooky graphics and sinister voices. Don't let this that be a Over what's supposed to be a serious conspiracy theory, you know it's bullshit. Or they're taking something like Pizzagate, like 9 11, like the Franklin Corps up, and they're adding layers of superficial bullshit on top of it and they're killing what is the real story down below so remember that always check to see if you're not running down the rabbit hole too deep going into warren holes and running off into places that will only lead to your eventual frustration and do not get overexcited about these things and do not be going around preaching to your workmates or your girlfriend or your husband or your boyfriend or your family or your kids because they will just laugh at you. Once you're awake, it's enough. Now, I'm not saying that I don't respect this ability to make good art, but to show you this on the next segment of the show, I'm going to be talking about the Mothman events in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, on the Ohio River in 1960s, and a bigger look at that, a new look at that story. But before I've made this short video, now this is a piece of art. There's no truth in this. I completely made this story up. But I want you to watch this story because one, I'm a frustrated horror filmmaker, and two, it just goes to show you the power of sound and imagery and how you can spin a yarn, taking some truths, as in the case of what J. Edgar Hoover was like, and adding additional flavours and spice to it to turn it out into something else. So what I'm going to watch here is a work of art by me, just a piece of entertainment, but a very good example of the kind of thing you can do to embellish or polish a turd. And though in this case, I'm quite proud of this film. It's pretty fucking good, and I think you'll enjoy it. So I'll see you on the other side of... I asked my love To take a walk To take a walk Just a little walk down beside where the waters flow down by the banks of the Ohio Goddamn shit they put me through me this Goddamn hero in the shithole full of rubes. I'm sick of this goddamn. Investigate you stupid little. I am sinned. I am sinned. I am sinned.
tell you, this is just bullshit. God only knows how many illegitimate children have been conceived down here. What an absolute shithole. What's this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hello, Mark Man. They're good old Point Pleasant. Bring in the tourist bullshit. There's one born every minute, my friend. One born every minute. What do we have here? Spring, spring, spring Hill. Jack Parsons. Ah, whatever that means. Yep. Do, do what thou will. And the obligatory visit from our. And welcome back to the second half of the Velocity of Now. With me, your host, Thomas Sheridan, here on YouTube, on the Thomas Sheridan channel. I've got two other channels on YouTube I hope you check out and subscribe to. They're full of lots and lots of interesting stuff, particularly 40 and occult stuff. One is called Open Source Occult TV, and the other one is called beyond room 313 you can find links in the description below and uh, so please subscribe to everything i have and welcome back to this 40th segment of the show although i suppose everything in this life is 40 to some degree or another especially when you're detached from the abrahamic mind view of things and you realize that there is a, a supernatural intelligence that underlies all nature and all reality. Therefore, you, I don't like. I don't think about politicians and voting or trying to change the system or anything like that because I understand that there are far greater forces behind all that that are much more worth giving your time and your energy to because they unlock secrets about the consciousness. Of humanity, they unlock secrets about the nature of reality and the universe, and the unlocking of these secrets makes your life a lot more easier, and you're less likely to be impacted upon by the slings and arrows of reductionist, materialist, everyday, atheistic, and Abrahamic fortune. Carrying on from the first hour, a way to see things in terms of a holistic view and not continuing on the path to which the convention regarding a story or a concept or its narrative and then moving away from it is a much better way to tackle things uh, because if the narrative and the convention of the story is true you'll come back to it naturally if it's not you create a new tangent of discovery and research so for instance a few months ago i told people or last year i told people to start to meditate upon the octopus uh, my belief was that the octopus is actually an alien creature that came to this planet from somewhere else. I now know where. Well, I have a good a good hunch of where. And suddenly, octopuses were everywhere. 
everywhere. And people are saying they were seeing octopus. This article's about octopus. TV shows about octopus. Everything. T- today I even saw a thread on an Irish normie message board. And like it's so normie this message board it would actually make us sick. But someone started a thread about how neat o- the octopus is. And they're going through and saying, that's amazing, I didn't know they had nine brains and three hearts and their brains, are sh- the main brain is shaped like a donut, etc. And their RNA is so strange and all this kind of stuff. And then somebody just mentioned casually that uh, they're so alien to all of their life on this planet. They're probably from somewhere else and the Pam Spare Me idea. And this guy who's just been boasting about, you know, reading a book about the evolutionary science of octopuses. A typical normie trying to prove how clever he is. A civil servant or something. The, uh, he comes in with, oh yes, and it's peer reviewed too. As if, as if the peer review was the only measure of quantification of reality. That unless it's peer reviewed, it doesn't exist. So his, his wife wouldn't have a vagina if it, unless he found a peer reviewed document saying that she had. This is literally what these people are like. Oh yes, it's peer reviewed too. Therefore, I can accept it. And you see, like you can just see how dead they are inside when they, they use those kind of language and, and cite those kind that kind of way of thinking. And it was, but still, it was amazing to see that they had indulged without ridicule the concept of the octopus being an alien from another planet, which it is. And with recent discoveries about Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, it now ejects water from its watery interior. It's covered in ice, but the interior is full of water. It ejects water like a geyser and spews this water far out into space. Well, there is your there is your potential for how the octopuses came to Earth. They originally are from the interior of the planet Europa. The geysers ejected out into space with octopuses or even full full grown octopuses or octopuses' eggs in it. And this is then immediately frozen by the cold of space into a cryogenic state and flies towards the inner atmosphere. The perfect spaceship or to other planets in a billion years time. The perfect spaceship cryogenically frozen in seawater or salt water and then this comes in to the Earth's atmosphere at some point in the past and could be continuing to this day for all we know. And it dissolves in the upper atmosphere and octopus eggs rain down onto the sea. And the chance of hitting the sea is much more than hitting the land because most of the planet is covered in seawater. And that's how the octopus came to Earth, in my opinion. Well, if other information comes along, it's as good a theory as any. They were ejected from by these geysers from the center, watery center of Europa zoomed across the solar system to eventually these perfect cryogenic frozen spaceships to melt in the upper atmosphere and voila we have the octopus the alien invader and this is only explains a lot of things and it's not far-fetched so yes You've often heard me for years saying that there's no proof that aliens from other planets arrived here on spaceships. Well, we're wrong. They've come here, octopuses have come here in spaceships made of frozen sea ice. And suddenly it's a fantastic thing. It's almost like the moment when you discover something magical has a scientific explanation for it, like the double slit experiment or quantum entanglement. And this is why these people who go, it's not peer-reviewed, miss the point. The allegories, the conceptions, the ideas are according to a holistic view. And if mythology hits, mythology or literature or art, you know, ticks those boxes, that's as good as any peer-reviewed science document in my world. I operate under the Greek classical pagan concept of noetics, the feeling that you're on the right path. The feeling and sensation that you're being guided by your daemon to the correct conclusion or a conclusion that you need to find out. No matter what the results eventually pan out as being. Which brings us to the Mothman story. I first became aware of the Mothman story and it was very little known in popular culture and this is the amazing thing about it where people knew 
I'd heard about Sasquatch and the, the Jersey Devil. They'd even been featured in episodes of the the X Files. There was very little coverage or ever popular investigation into the whole Mothman phenomenon. Even among Fortians. I first became aware of it back in the 1990s. In an issue of Fortean Times, there was an interview, I think, with John Keel, the author of the original book, The Mothman Prophecy. Not the one that was made to go with that very good and quite moving and beautiful movie with Richard Gere. But the original book was simply about the the events that took place in Point, Pe- Point Pleasant in, o- in West Virginia on the Ohio River in 1966 and 1967. John Keel took an interest in UFOlogy and there was massive flaps or sightings of UFOs around the United States in the mid 60s and he traveled around to investigate them and he became the first American UFOlogist to surmise that we're not dealing necessarily or if at all with alien spacecraft from other planets but we're probably dealing with something close to fairy folklore. A truism that, like Rosemary Ellen Guiley, had him literally booed off the stage at UFO conferences in America when he announced that he didn't believe in the alien visitation theory, that these phenomena, these lights in the sky, are somehow connected to fairy folklore. The same thing happened to great Rosemary Ellen Guiley when she said the same about the djinn, that she no longer believed in the alien spaceship theory, that this was part of an interdimensional phenomenon. And this was also, you know, beautifully encapsulated by Jacques Vallée. And recent authors like David Moore in England, this concept that there's much more to this this UFO and alien experience than there is merely spacecrafts from other planets visiting here. And... That has was created by the military industrial complex in the USA as a Cold War weapon, not just because they couldn't explain it, and they really couldn't, but also because it was a handy propaganda device to have Americans think that they had spaceman technology, like the same way the Germans thought they had the wonder weapon at the end of World War Two that would defend them against the Russians who were the first ones to put a satellite in the sky and there was Sputnik flying over the United States and the Americans all traumatised by it and then the Soviets detonating a massive hydrogen bomb the Americans were desperate to leave that something was on their side so they gave them secular gods in the form of flying saucer men that had landed at Roswell, New Mexico and the American Air Force made up a whole ruse that they had the technology to protect themselves, to protect the, the Americans and apple pie from the Soviets, who were far more technologically advanced at that point. Anyway, John Keel travelling across the United States ended up in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and just to follow the lights. Now, this was the beginning of it. In 1966, these these lights were seen, reported in the media as flying saucers, but the eyewitness accounts described them very differently. They said they were beautiful coloured lights. They were there was almost an emotional quality to them. In coupling in coupling with this and go, in tandem in cohesion with this were these strange experiences of the men in black phenomena. I'll talk about this later. But the closing event in the Point Pleasant experience, which really should be called the the Point Pleasant, you know, paranormal year or year and a half, was because there were so many things other than the Mothman took place in it, was the collapse of the Silver Bridge. Now, the Silver Bridge across the Ohio River was a state-of-the-art suspension bridge made from lengths of steel rather than ropes and it was built in 1927 and it connected the cities of Point Pleasant in West Virginia with Gallipolis in Ohio just across the Ohio River. It was made from a new type of carbon steel 
the bridge collapsed in 1967. If you look at the photographs of it, it didn't just collapse. It, it was like the World Trade Center on 9-11. It literally dissolved. And eyewitnesses said that it, it, it shook violently. It, it behaved strangely before it went, as if some force was impacting upon it. In fact, people believed that at first that a barge on the Ohio River had crashed into one of the piers and caused the bridge to fall. But they said it was it was like a shock hit it. Now, according to the investigation, an I-beam, it was like a circular clip in one of the bars that was had cracked. And eventually, after months and months, they found the missing piece. And they surmised that was probably what caused the bridge to collapse with all the traffic on it waiting for the traffic lights all the christmas traffic was on the river, on the bridge waiting for a red light to turn green and this clip had failed due to a fault in the manufacturing process and then you know the weathering and the years and the cold weather and so on had taken its toll upon it and it finally snapped at all the traffic for christmas but this was only a theory it wasn't really seen as the main cause of it. Anyway, 47 cars went into the river and 30 people died. And it was a, a great catastrophe for the local community. Now, some people said they saw the Mothman underneath the bridge. But there's a more interesting factor in this. When the bridge went down, it was literally swarming with federal agents. Now, what were federal agents doing on the site of a so-called accident, a random accident? This was the thing that set off my suspicions. Now, I finally got a copy back in the 90s of the original edition of The Mothman Prophecy by John Keel with its wonderful cover, which shows a kind of an angelic spring heel Jack kind of being. Over the town of Point Pleasant. Beautiful classic, you know, one of those classic Fortean or horror or science fiction paperback covers you used to get back in those days. And the book just spellbound me. It just blew my mind because I, it was just everything I wanted. But there was one factor that he didn't cover in the book. I'm not saying it's suspicious or anything. I, well, I have no memory of it. it maybe he covered it, maybe he did in later editions. And I think this is a, a, f a bigger issue within the Mothman and the whole Point Pleasant th uh, experience than what's given credit. Okay, firstly, let me put, nail my colours to the mass that we're dealing with a fairy folklore thing. We're not, you know, and I think most cryptids, whether they're, you know, Bigfoot or the Jersey Devil or whatever, they're, they're this is all part of the fairy phenomena. This is an interdimensional experience that has leaked over into this reality. Now, before the initial UFO sightings took place in and around the Ohio River in Point Pleasant and in the hills around it, there were stories of what was called satanic rituals performed in the old TNT building on the outskirts of Point Pleasant. During World War II, the United States government built an enormous munitions depot to create shells and bombs and other explosive and incendiary devices for the war effort. It was a semi-highly secret operation and employed quite a lot of people in a very hazardous work environment with strong, strict security arrangements. After the war ended, the TNT area was essentially abandoned and eventually would be so polluted from all the chemicals that were used there in the production of munitions that it became one of the most toxic places in the United States and it was declared a biohazard region by the Environmental Protection Agency. In this area, people in early 1966 had reported that it was what they call sat satanic rituals were being performed in there. At the same time, the area seemed to have been taken over by federal agents. Now, the eyewitnesses to all the events, when you when they were asked about, did you think 
the so-called satanic rituals that are being performed in the TNT area had anything to do with the creation of the Mothman. They said, no, it didn't. It had nothing to do with it. Now, I found this very strange, why they were so adamant about it. This could be because these people were, you know, Appalachian, Scotch, Ulster Scots, Presbyterian Christians who probably preferred not to think about such things and uh, couldn't probably couldn't conceive that somebody was on a very organized level were creating what they called satanic rituals but we don't know what the nature of them were inside the TNT region now Point Pleasant is not super far from Washington DC and it's not super far from all those federal agents and places like the Pentagon and so on to get to but it's remote enough to perform should we say non-material warfare operations in the 1960s when it was becoming apparent that the United States was having great difficulty in Vietnam they would have been desperate to try and try anything and we know from the likes of the men who stared into goats that they did experiment with non-conventional warfare methods, Fortean ideas, paranormal, psychic telekinesis. This would also makes me believe that why wouldn't they try magic? Why wouldn't they try occult rituals? Especially as half of them from Washington D.C. involved at the highest levels of the CIA and the federal, the FBI would have been all Freemasons anyway, and open to the idea of ritual and magic. Not in public, but definitely in their own in internal worlds. And the perfect place to do this would have been Point Pleasant in the TNT area. To perform these magic rituals. As testing a kind of a way of warfare. Not too far from Washington DC. But rural and remote enough. To use the community as an experiment. And what if these quote-unquote satanic rituals performed by these federal agents opened a portal? And through that portal first came these UFOs, these fly, quote-unquote flying saucers, these coloured lights. And then also came through that portal was this creature known as the Mothman. Perhaps a, a life form, a, a fairy or some kind of entity from another dimension that was pulled into this one by these by these rituals. Now the beginning of the Mothman story starts with the the coloured lights and the strange lights all seen along the Ohio Valley and around the TNT area. This is what brought John Keel to the region. It was very heavily covered. In the, in the local media, John Keel himself said he saw the he saw numerous times saw these 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 flying lights in the sky. They were so common. And then in tandem with this, we have this strange men in black experience, which again I'll, I'll talk about later. At the TNT area, four teenagers force laid eyes upon this mothman creature it was about seven or eight feet tall had they could not see its fa face or could not remember what its face looked like because its red piercing eyes were so intense that they almost seemed to hypnotize or try to communicate with you telepathically it had large wings and the mere act of opening its wings without flapping it could fly At first, the four young people who reported the event and got plenty of coverage in the local newspapers said that they were frightened, but then they became almost fond of the creature and took pity on it. They said that when other people had seen the Mothman around Point Pleasant, what they'd noticed was that it, would, it, it seemed lost like it was trying to get home it was it was trying to find its way back to where it came from 
it seemed to be affected badly by the cold, trying to keep itself warm. And it would look at people almost like with a sense of, please help me. And they said that there was almost a sense of compassion that they felt towards it. It wasn't sinister. It did frighten them because an eight foot flying creature with angel wings and piercing bright red eyes staring at you will will of course you know disturb you and affect you especially with those things like flying alongside your car this is also happening in tandem with federal agents swarming around point pleasant these strange men in black phone calls and visitations as well as the lights so the the community was almost in a already in a state of severe agitation which is probably what if this is a federal experiment in the occult is probably what they wanted they were testing it as a psychological or a, even a spiritual warfare concept many people became to see that the moth band's manifestation was a portent of doom connected to the destruction or the collapse of the silver bridge not an unfeasible idea because they started to compare things like the banshee and the population of west virginia in that area would be predominantly people of irish and scottish heritage so they would have taken their folklore and their folklore archetypes with them but at the same time too they'd have difficulty with the fairy concept being americans because one of the issues with the whole fairy thing is that americans have a very strange notion and unrealistic understanding of what fairies are a fairy folklore mainly due to things like tinkerbell in the likes of snow white or disney and all these cartoons Celtic people in Ireland and Scotland and in Cornwall and such places lived in absolute terror of the fairies. Fairies were equivalent to demons in these cultures and people went to enormous lengths to avoid the fairies. Quite different than how they were portrayed by American popular culture as being fun or charming or sexy like Tinkerbell, flirtatious until ironically that that series of movies came out in the 80s and 90s called leprechaun and i remember when the first leprechaun movie came out about a homicidal psychopathic leprechaun um uh, that um, irish americans complained about it because that's not what fairies are and i was like no you're wrong that's exactly how our ancestors saw fairies exact that film leprechaun is exactly how irish people saw fairies and leprechauns and so that was the kind of funny irony, but also showed the cultural disconnect between Irish Americans and people in Ireland. Anyway, this misunderstanding about fairies saying, well, it's not, this is the banshee, it's support and the doom, but they, you know, they, they, they are very difficult for the Americans to get their, eye, their, their mind around the idea of fairies being connected to danger and terror. And therefore they were unable to fully grasp the profundity and the accuracy of the encapsulating the entire Mottman Point Pleasant 1966-67 events within fairy folklore as John Keel was doing it. And then there's another ironic aspect to it is that when Alien sightings were first reported in the United States. The disparaging term was to use little green men. Which is ironic because that's again describing fairies. So Keel, you know, he really was a genius to have like, to have brought this into focus. This concept, this, this whole understanding of the Mothman and the whole UFO event alien event into the bringing it into the the fairy folklore framework this is also why later on Jacques Filet was never really accepted by mainstream UFOlogy because again he, comp he compared it to something beyond 
aliens, something that was here, and there's a strange connection with cults and with UFO investigators working for the government. Constantly pushing the idea that these are flying saucer men who've arrived in spacecrafts from other other planets. And John Keel, in his one of his later books, was quite actively aggressive towards these uh, UFO, ufologists and these UFO conventions and saying things like calling them, he was calling them cult members and things like this. They could not switch the alien element off in their heads. They just couldn't do it. They just could not. We were incapable psychologically, intellectually of doing it. And all the, and this is all because they were falling for the, the whole lie put out there by the US government, the military industrial complex, using everything from Hollywood movies about it came from outer space and so on, flying saucers versus the earth, in order to stranglehold the alien phenomena on top of the what is a fairy folklore phenomenon. But I'm glad to see that among the alternative scene, there's a greater willingness now to grasp the fact that we're dealing with fairies or demons or something like that when it comes to the the alien thing. And just, you know, just to prove once more that Crowley really is the architect of today. It was his Awas and Lamb and these, these entities and so on, which is kind of copper fastened the notion and emerging notion that the alien phenomena is really a folklore phenomena rooted in this planet and probably an interdimensional aspect and that's what happened with the Mothman thing if I was to put a, put a guess on it federal government agents chose that area because if it's not too far from Washington DC it's remote and rural enough to conduct an experiment in the town of Point Pleasant is just the right size and they probably did rituals in demonology and they opened the portal and they brought through this thing that came to be known as the Mothman and if you look at the newspaper clippings of the time they're not that cynical surprisingly you would never see journalism like that these days they're not that cynical there's a great sympathy for the, the the experience on the population. Now you have the the moron academics and quackademics who came out and said things like it was a giant crane, a giant crane with red eyes that can pierce into people's souls. You know that's another one was they said that it was a big owl. I mean it's just ridiculous. Although people did say that when the moth man tried to move. On the ground, it lumbered somewhat in a similar way to how an owl works. It was uncomfortable on the ground, but this thing was there's no owl that's eight feet tall and can fly without flapping its wings and can look into your soul by peering into its red eyes. Another element of the Mothman experience with John Keel brought forward from his research and was absolutely mind-blowing to me was that there was one episode where it tried to literally steal a blood truck you know the trucks that go around and getting blood from people and it, it hovered over this blood transfusion or blood you know donation truck and at one point they thought it was going to over either fly away with the truck or open it up as if it wanted the blood inside and John Keel being an excellent researcher asked all the women who had encountered Mothman were you menstruating and sure enough they were all menstruating at the time they saw the Mothman now this brings you back to the other things like the Slua this is the blood fairy of Irish folklore it's a blood fairy that needs that takes blood. It's almost like an interdimensional vamp, giant vampire bat. And then you see this thing. The Mothman seemed to have an, a, an, a thing with blood. So, you know, th th that brings it more to the cryptozoology end of things. But just because a fairy exists or comes through a portal or something or we encounter one. Doesn't mean that we're encountering something that's made of mist or made of dust 
or you know somehow like a transparent thing like a like a ghost ephemeral or something it can be corporeal and solid and matter based in its structure as any living mammal or bird or fish or anything that exists in this reality it's just in the wrong reality hence why it has mass it has density it has a personality this is was the same thing with ufos i saw my first ufo about five years ago now and the impression was that it was a living thing i was looking at i wasn't looking at a machine i was looking at something that was alive and this was the thing that john keel said from his own ufo sightings along the ohio valley and elsewhere he said he had the overwhelming impression he was looking at an animal he was looking at an animal or a creature of some kind It's one of these things that Darwinism ceased to exist very quickly. Like if octopuses, they they could find out tomorrow that octopuses, if they found if they found out tomorrow that octopuses did come from Europa, they wouldn't want to put it out there because it would be the end of Darwinism. Everything was supposed to you know evolve on this earth as it was from the primordial soup nonsense. What if all the what if these like sudden animals that we that we suddenly appear fully formed and often in large numbers that have never been discovered before. I'm not talking about like insects or butterflies. We're talking about large mammals that suddenly no one was aware of and then all of a sudden the Amazon rainforest is full of them. Where are these from? Was this a breeding pair that came through from another dimension? Another reality. And that's what Mothman was. And this is what fairies are. That's what fairy folklore belief is. That they're, they're from another, another reality. Fairyland. And this is what made John Keel's great... If the if mainstream ufology had followed the work of the like of John Keel and Jacques Fillet, we'd be a hell of a lot better off now than ancient aliens talking about spaceships and alien spacemen and coming down from planets to build things that our ancestors built. They just think it'd be a whole different... A whole different body of, of, of uh, research and experience, but yet... You know, mainstream UFOlogy is still obsessed with pushing the U.S. the U.S. military's industrial military complex narrative on what the spaceships are. Point Pleasant was a portal. If the if my if those satanic rituals, I suspect, reopen that portal. If that didn't happen, then something caused a portal there to rip open in 1966 and bring through all these experiences. The men in black are also kind of a fairy as well. There was, a, in the 1950s in Dublin, there was a, a character known as the, the Well-Just Gentleman who went around a really poor neighbourhood in Dublin where people were living in great poverty after World War Two. For a long time, and he would give money to people. He would he would show up at the doors, and he became this spectral form, a an urban fairy. And if you look at the descriptions now, they're probably talking about a man in black thing. The men in black are almost like fairies who are trying. To, they're almost like fairies who are spacemen, in this reality, interdimensional travelers, and they're trying to pass themselves off as as humans. But they do it very clum clumsily and they're cumbersome and they don't fully understand their conventions and how we function. They try to mimic humanity but don't do it very well. It's almost like are the men in black the shamanic fairies? Just like humans go into the spirit world dressed as jaguars and other animals to mimic animals. Do the men in black do the same in our world? Are they shamans of a different spiritual life form? Or fairies in another dimension? This is the thing with the whole Fortean thing. It's the same with the whole study of Lovecraft. It's locked within conventions that have been set. Forms, memes, tropes, narratives that have been set in stone. And anything outside them is, is never properly 
given the credit it should be. Like, for instance, Whitley Strieber and his book Communion. He was under tremendous pressure by the publishers to, to talk about them as space aliens. And he compromised and called them visitors, which I thought was a brilliant, a brilliant way around it. And even in the second book, Transformation, he goes into great detail about how he compares the aliens that he experienced in upstate New York to something akin to the fairy folklore of Ireland. And he he even speculates that if his own Irish background somehow made him receptible to this. Again, Port Point Pleasant, most of these people would be Celtic of Irish background in West Virginia. Appalachians originally, Scotch-Irish. This could have been another reason why the feds went to Point Pleasant. And as Lovecraft said, I read the letter in the last week in the... He said it numerous times that Celtic, Teutonic and Jews are open to supernatural experiences more than other races. It's fantastic stuff. And yet we're reduced to ancient aliens, which actually... The, the last episode, the last series of Ancient Aliens was quite good about the megaliths and stuff like that. Of course, they had to, some, they had to bring in certain people every so often and say, oh, there's a spaceship or something. But at least we got to see some great footage of, uh, of megaliths and stuff filmed beautifully. But the, the UFO thing, uh, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know, like the, I've, I've seen things by ufologists who went to Point Pleasant. And... They were only interested in the, in the flying saucer stories. And they could not even grasp that the men in black and the mothman was connected to it. They would say things like, oh, well, they they invented a lie of the mothman to distract from the the flying saucers, the spacemen. Or they invented a men in black. These are federal agents pretending to to pretending to be something in order to distract from the, the aliens visiting. They're unable to actually put stitch the whole lot of them together. Now, the Silver Bridge, was that caused by a rupture in the psychic field? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot, that could be a lot of truth to that. That when you open up, look, just think about it like, like poltergeist experiences, right? When I was doing my occult experiments, things would fly off the walls. This is like the indication that you're actually, you've opened the door. Books would fly off shelves. Things would turn upside down. My house was snapped in two, practically, when I was writing my book, Sorcery. You're, 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 you're ripping open fields. You're disrupting the space-time quantum reality. Now, if you have something as massive as this experiment, which could have taken place in 1966, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, yeah, why not? The, the, the people on the bridge said that it felt like a force had crashed into the bridge. They thought it was a barge. The bridge didn't just collapse. It literally dissolved. It literally dissolved. As if some force had crumpled it. I always got the impression about 9-11 too as well. It was, like a, it was like a psychic force were crumpling those towers. Pushing them down like a hand, two hands from above pushing them down. The same, and the same feeling, the same sense, and that you know, if you look at the videos of Point Pleasant after the bridge collapses, a sense of wickedness. It's, so, it's like the same kind of sense of wickedness when the towers went on nine eleven. Your subconscious mind tells you there's a hell of a lot here going, more going on than what we're being told or what we even see. There's, there's my, my feelings, my sensations and inclinations are taking me to another dimension of this, to another another part of this experience that's beyond this it's just like when you go to a megalith and you it's a pile of stones in a circle but you're you're something happens you're transformed you have a shift in consciousness you it's altered i've never been to point pleasant i'd love to go and i know you know it's not going to be the same as it was then it's changed an awful lot just like the same thing New England fishing villages don't look like they do in the, the days of Lovecraft but you st I still want to go I still want to go to Point Pleasant Pro I'd love to go to the to the uh, the Mothman Festival I know it's it's twee and it's a big tourist thing in many ways but it's also I've looked at some of the researchers and people there over the the deck over the years and there's some pretty interesting stuff goes on there too as well plus there would be 
psychic fallout or radiation still in the area which would be there to be picked up regardless and I know that for me would, that would be something I would desperately want not desperately but I would love to to experience this this the psychic residue will be still be there now the fascinating thing about the Mothman thing in Point Pleasant was that after the Silver Bridge collapsed it was never seen in the area ever again it was like literally a switch was switched on Mothman, flying saucers, men in black, strange visions, nightmares, people experiencing strange things, visions in the daytime, this, this Fortean Woodstock, you know, Lollapalooza happens, and then bang, it's switched off. The gate, the gate was opened at the TNT area, it says the UFOs in the sky, and then the gate was closed. The portal was closed. The ritual was ended, and it collapsed the Silver Bridge. I don't think it was intentional, but I do. It does explain why it was suddenly swarming with fre- federal agents. What were federal agents doing there before a bridge collapsed? And you can say, well, they knew it was going to collapse. But not necessarily. They could have just been there monitoring the situation anyway, for documentation of what was going on with the local population. They would have looked at them. They would have. They would have looked at every minutia of their lives who was getting married who was getting when were they getting married who was eating in the restaurant who stopped eating in the restaurant who started drinking who committed suicide what relationships and the day would be of monitoring everything they could in that community everything all data and if that's that's and then they knew something was probably going to happen when the portal closed and maybe some kind of psychic vacuum sucked the silver bridge and chewed it up who was in those cars remember those that was the bridge was full of people people in their cars on christmas eve a lot of them in an agitated state because of the strangeness going on in the area and also at christmas time it it's one of those times of year that the veil is open, that the door opens, that we're more receptive to the other side, that the veil is lifted a lot more. So it was there waiting to happen. And it never took place again. Why? Because maybe the feds just left and moved on somewhere else. Now, all through history, these kind of things have been seen. They've been seen in Portugal, right not, before the, even the Fatima event. They were seen in England. This is always a story of a spaceship landing, common thing with a new phology, and this bird creature comes out and flies away. It was seen everywhere. These things have been seen commonly, and apparently when Chernobyl happened, mothmen were seen all around Chernobyl. Now there's a concept to try and put this with the whole thing of the Thunderbird, the giant flying bird, but I don't believe we're dealing with a cryptozoology thing. I think we're dealing with something, an interdimensional thing. I think a lot of the cryptozoology stuff is interdimensional, and it's just labelled. I know in the case of the the Loch Ness Monster, absolutely that was opened up, the portal was opened up by Crowley, the Abomellon ritual, and was never shut, and then the, the, the Loch Ness Monster starts appearing, and is with us ever since, and the activity has increased as... Boleskine House has been restored by the OTO and there's more sightings and better sightings of the Loch Ness Monster that also explains why when you take photographs of them you don't see them clearly they're not fully there but they're there as well at the same time that's another tip for all you budding researchers into the 40 and the paranormal get back to analogue you can't trust digital you just can't it's so easy to lie and manipulate that's why I trust things that the photographs are from the old days of old film photographs and analog tape recordings on magnetic tape that's why you get better EP electronic voice phenomena and so on on tape on cassette tape that's what I've tried anything like that now I use cassette tape The digital stuff is just nonsense. It's just, it's, you see, the thing with digital is, right, it's a lossless technology, meaning that when you transfer from one, it's so perfect from like one copy to the next, there's absolutely no loss in quality. But think about it, it's also gainless as well. 
the complexity of the analog signal and things like magnetic tape and the the ferrous oxide coating there's all kinds of variables and subtleties there in order for something to sneak through and get into it and that's why i think you know things like ghost boxes and stuff like that is nonsense i if it's analog keep it if it's digital it's, it, i don't trust that anything like that for and that's not to say what you know we're seeing videos that are are the real thing they could be i think it's but you can't trust them anymore because it's so easy to do post production and add things and that's why i think the likes of the mothman endures the mothman story endures the mothman legacy endures the mothman phenomena endures uh, because it comes from a time when analog was killing 38 millimeter film 16 millimeter cinema film reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders cassette tape recorders dictaphones all analog devices old-fashioned wired telephones that the the men in black can communicate in because maybe they get into the phone lines or something like that also what the phenomena of the mothman thing tells us is that the past present and future is irrelevant irrelevant and this is why people used to summon demons to get information from the future because the demons existed outside space time and this could have been even we never know that could have been also one of the reasons that drove the if the feds were down there doing magic rituals maybe they wanted the information on the future will america will the cold war Will America be defeated by the Viet Cong? Will the civil rights... The America was in a bad way then, a very bad way. And there was, you know, you had the civil rights problems in the, in the South. And there was West Virginia, a Union state on the South, on the border with the South. It's sandwiched between the Ohio River and Washington, D.C. It would have been, in many ways, the epicenter of all the psychic issues going on within the US at that time with the civil rights movement with the emerging Vietnam thing and so on the and the fears of the Cold War Cuba and so on the Cuban missiles crisis was a, was still a relatively recent memory and that's the thing I think that the Mothman teaches us what we've learned from John Keel is this is how isn't this a much more interesting way to develop it and to study these things and to look into them than to just generally say, oh, it's a, it's a space alien thing and the government are hiding it from us. And as we're getting increasingly bombarded with this new, this new form of ufology, keep all that in mind. It's just like when John Keel started saying, hold on, these are not spaceships there's something to do with folklore and there are more of a spiritual element to them you remember that going forward because that 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 trope is as true as it ever was and if you see lights in the sky or crop circles or something like that you say to yourself ah aliens ask yourself do you really believe that or is it because t mainstream tv programming has made you believe that way I would suggest you get the book, The Mothman Experience, the original copy, not the one based on the movie. Although I have to say that movie is actually a very beautiful movie, the one with Richard Gere. It's really about a kind of a, a monomyth, a hero's journey. One of the books I have on The Mothman, which I really, really I like, and I suggest is a great one to have in your 40 rep reference library, is entitled Mothman. The Facts Behind the Legend by Donnie Sargent Jr. and Jeff Walmsley. What I like about this book is they interview the eyewitnesses and they show their handwriting so they haven't, the handwritten letters that they wrote, testimonies. They have many clippings that were unseen before from local newspapers and they just get in there and they talk about what happened without swinging a narrative or a story on it. It's, it's almost like a good old-fashioned journalistic account of the events and you know i'll just read the on the back of them holding it right in my hand here it's an a4 size so it's a large uh, format book and it's a softback cover and it says on the back 
The headline that started it all, Couple see man-sized bird creature, something. On the night of November 15, 1966, two adventurous young couples drove into the TNT area north of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. What they saw in the countryside that night has evolved into one of the great mysteries of all time. Just who or what was the Mothman? This book will answer many questions regarding just what the couple saw outside the abandoned North Power plant that night, culled from a variety of sources. The materials presented inside are not conjectured. The authors are careful not to cross the line between fact and fiction, leaving any decisions regarding the truth behind the Mothman legend solely up to the reader. That's The Mothman, The Facts Behind the Legend by Donnie Sargent Jr. and Jeff Walmsley, W-A-M-S-L-E-Y. Highly recommend it just because it's a great 40 in research. These are the kind of books I like. They don't overtly swing stories around. They don't overtly throw narratives in, except in the case of someone like John Keel. They hint it's like this. It's more akin to this, but they don't firmly nail your colours to the mast. Now, as I said, the philosophy of now is going more into a 40 and artistic kind of format. And I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. The numbers of last week's show, uh, it, it wasn't even last week. It's only four days now and it's, up to, it's, got, it's heading towards 10,000 views already. So thank you very much for joining in that. I will see you on the next episode of Velocity of Now. If you'd like to add your own element to the Mothman discussion, the comments are below. I would love to hear it. And it's... And keep researching keep looking and keep journeying and look beyond the drudgery of everyday life see everything as a magical experience step into the miasma of mystery into the haze and steam of the supernatural dance among this twinkling twilight of the setting sun and the night stars and allow the meteorites and their beautiful trails across the sky to rain into your heart and soul. See you next week and feck them if they can't take a joke.